of the build. And the fourth one, and we're skipping Chris for now because he's in an airplane. Uh, and Xiaolong is going to talk about the rest of the drive stuff. All right. What I just talked about. Okay. Oh, sweet. So here's the key metrics for our, is that like the bar on the top, a thing? So this table with the picture show the key metrics of our motor as of now. We have rated power of one megawatt, uh, rated efficiency of 97%, which is all within the specs. Um, our, rate, uh, our weight clocks in at 144.2 pounds right now, and uh, that gives us a specific power of 15 kilowatts per kilogram, um, and that is also within our uh, specification. Sweet. So the key dimensions, we have um, the following key dimensions. We have the outer diameter. Um, at about 13 inches, we have uh, the active length about 8.8 .8 inches. So you have kind of a feel about how big our motor is as of now. OK, the weight breakdown. Um, I told you the weight was 144.18 before, and here's the breakdown of it. Um, we have about 24 pounds of uh, 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 leeway, if you will. So we could use that as our you know, future opportunities for you know, design changes if we end up having that. OK, design summary. So to you know, give you an idea about how we are pushing the power density of our motor to match you know, or be better than other ones, um, uh, I put this slide together to compare our key metric values, key design values, with other ones. So if you look at copper current density, the best in class in terms of aer uh, aerospace industry, we're at 30 amps per millimeter squared. And that's liquid cool. If you talk about um, air cooled, the, which we are adopting, uh, the values is about uh, five to ten. So that's where where we're pushing our design limits. But if you think of, uh, if you look at other values, the electrical loading, um, that really has to do with uh, the heat flux of the design. And since we have a narrow band of winding area, uh, we are able to get you know a fair fairly low electrical loading even with high copper density. Um, our air gap flux density is comparable with other ones, shear stress, and rotor tip speed. Um, so after we take this design, um, looking at it in FE analysis, we get our back EMF about 375 volts RMS, about 0 0.063 per unit of synchronous reactants. Null for state resistance as of now, <laughs> and nominal speed at 15,000 RPM. Okay. So what's interesting about our motor is because if you look at conventional designs of motors, you have, you know, you will see some harmonics in your air gap or in your back EMF. But since we are adopting uh, uh, no teeth to our design, you can see that our air gap flux density is pretty sinusoidal, and that results in, you know, a nearly sinusoidal back EMF for our uh, motor, and we're excited about that. Um, Here's the depiction of the armature connection that we have. We're going to have five of these little modules that make up the one megawatt. So each is rated at 200 kilowatts. Um, the line-to-line -line voltage is going to be 650, 184 amps. And then we have two series of three turns each. So this would be three turns and three turns, and that'll make up six series turns per phase. And we have a 5 sixth coil pitch, which gives us a winding factor of such. And then we do, you know, uh, kind of like a verification about uh, for the back EMF that we got from our FE analysis, and the math checks out. As for our permanent magnet, uh, we have two choices. As of now, we've chosen samarium cobalt because we we're assuming or we've done some calculations or, or, or analysis to see what the temperature on the magnet's going to be, and it's clocking at about 150 degrees Celsius. And at that point, uh, our remnant flux density between the two magnets are comparable. So we're using samarium cobalt for now, but um, our uh, you know, choices might change after we do a, a, a rotor bench test for the windage losses, because that's 
the biggest uh, uncertainty as of now. Demagnetization during fault. So this is what you see during normal operation. The, the black arrows show uh, the orientation of the magnets, and the other arrows that you can kind of see are what the actual fields look like. Now, if you look at kind of the worst case scenario, line-to-line uh, -line fault and condition, you can see that the arrows are still the same as this one, but you can kind of see uh, the flux lines that don't align with the orientation of the magnet. And so this is kind of you know, to show you that magnet uh, demagnetization is possible. And in the near future, we're going to do some more studies on that to quantify um, our demag. Here's the loss breakdown. Uh, so far, we've done copper loss uh, calculations, and we did validate that via uh, bench tests. The other losses, we're going to be validating them in the near future. Um, and as of now, our machine efficiency, uh, with, with a given range of, of windage losses, our machine efficiency ranges from 97.4% to 98%. And this, on the left, shows you how uh, we kind of Uh, ended up with 15,000 RPM. Um, this shows you, I just mentioned that we have uh, kind of an uncertainty, a range of windage losses. And what uh, we did was from that, those range of windage losses at different speeds, we back calculated the allowable uh, electrical loading from it. And then from that, we you know, uh, did some FE analyses and then looked at the power. And it does show you that you know, in the middle curve, let's say, the um, 15,000 RPM is, it looks like the optimal range, but after we do a uh, rotor bench test and, you know, actually measure what the windage losses are going to be, we do expect um, still um, the nominal speed to be within the range of 14,000 RPM and 16,000 RPM. Going to the efficiency map, uh, this shows you uh, the efficiency map at different operating points. Um, so. Uh, from zero to nominal speed, uh, let's say 15,000 RPM, we have uh, linear increasing power and constant torque. And then after that, if you know at, at operating speeds bigger than 15,000 RPM, the nominal speed, we have a uh, constant power region. And this shows you uh, that 97.4% uh, our nominal operating point is in that knee of the curve. Whew. That's all I have. And now Reed's going to talk about the thermal designs. OK. Do we want to move the mic? Yes. Uh, you can do that. <laughs> You're not going to put that on me? No, I don't think so. Andy. OK. Hi there. I'm Reed. I'm going to talk about thermal and mechanical design. So really, we're asking two questions. So Andy answered, OK, what are we doing? What is our electromagnetic? Uh, machine doing? What is the goal? And then the thermal and mechanical portion is allowing the electromagnetics to do their job. And so we're asking two questions. The first question, question being a thermal question, will it burn up? Second question being a mechanical question, will it fly apart? These are important questions. Um, so first question, will it burn up? Uh, we don't think so. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about our forced air fan design and our system simulation as to why we don't think that's going to happen. OK, here we go. So this is our fan design. So really what we're doing is we're pulling air from the outside, from this back end region, like this arrow, arrow is throwing, through the heat sink and ejecting it out the side. We're doing that using this impeller design. So this is an impeller. The way an impeller works is as it spins, it pulls air into the center eye and ejects it out the side just like we're seeing here, right? OK. Um, there's the impeller again. So in order to size this impeller, we had to first find um, the pressure the pressure drop across all of our fins. We had to find our uh, rotational speed that we were going to be nominally working at, uh, our speed through the, through the channels, and um, our mass flow rate. So with those, with those parameters, we talked with uh, Joe Veras, who is actually with NASA, um, and came up with this design. And this is primarily his design, and we're very thankful for him. Um, and so as you can see, this is that same style of, 
of geometry, uh, this time with flat blades, and then 28, 28 of them as well. And this fits down at the bottom of our rotor. Uh, we are still actually doing a couple of redesigns, um, trying to also, rather than only pulling it through the heat sink, also going to be pulling some air through the air gap itself. And the air gap is, is right here along the interface of the, um, that's where the air is, along where the windings meet the magnets. And they never actually touch, by the way. Or that's the goal. They're never supposed to touch. Okay. So then, so that's our fan. Now let's talk about our simulation. Now, we've taken our whole machine and essentially put it into one pole. Um, and we're only simulating one pole because it's going to be radially symmetric. Okay, so on the stator side, this, so the side that does not move, um, we're seeing a hot spot temperature of 180, degree, 180 degrees Celsius, which is hotter than our previous um, uh, models, but we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Again, here on the, on the rotating side, we're seeing 150 degrees. Again, hotter, and this is why. Um, the reason it's hotter is because we went and actually measured our thermal conductivity. And our thermal conductivity was lower than we wanted it to be, than we originally anticipated. And so because we've had that, um, we've come up with this new model of our thermal conductivity, which we're using in our simulation, and is giving us these higher temperature results. Um, we still think that this motor is possible, um, our, simulation is, our simulations are still telling us that this is going to work. As we move into the rotor test, we're going to know more and more that our assumptions are true. Okay. Now, mechanical design. Really asking that question, will it fly apart? And there's two reasons why it could fly apart. First, rotor dynamics. And second, structural stability. And there's, again, two reasons why we could, uh, two ways that we can make sure that neither of the, Neither, neither of those things make it fly apart. And the first being simulation and the second being build and test. So our simulations say it won't fly apart. Now we're doing the build and test. So this is our actual rotor. So carbon fiber ring, titanium shell. So we're going to go through our test goals, the rotor itself, and a little bit about the bearing system which holds the whole system together. Okay, this is, our, this is a picture of our rotor test. Um, so, and there's four different goals that we have on this rotor test. First, expansion. Uh, how much is this air gap going to expand? This is a pretty critical dimension for us. Uh, losses. What are the windage losses? Windage being, as it rotates, there's frictional forces in between the air and the machine itself. What, how much power do we lose into that frictional forces of air? Um, what is the vibration that is caused by the rotation? And finally, what is the flow rate that happens through these channels? Um, and so this is some of our setup as to how we're going to uh, measure these different quantities. OK, so our rotor test. So we have made this. Another pretty important question is, can you build it? The answer is yes. Pretty excited about this. So again, here's our, here's our titanium shell. These are the air holes that, it, that the air is going to be exiting through. And here's our carbon fiber ring. This is the part that rotates. Um, we have created these dummy magnet segments. These segments are made out of the same density material as our real magnets. We're, we put these in because we need, to, we need to essentially simulate the same weight on inside the rotor. And real magnets are very expensive. Um, yeah. So that's this. OK. Bearing system. So this is really the rest of the system that, um, that we're using. Okay, our bearing system has a couple different components. Uh, the first is the bearings themselves. These are, that's these red parts, right? So these red parts, these red bearings, are trapped in between our rotor and our stator. Our rotor being, again, this, and our stator being this. Okay, uh, so we're trapping these parts in between our rotor and stator. Um, and then this is what allows the rotor to spin. The spring is what um, allows, if there's any thermal growth, essentially we're seeing this as it changes temperature, if there's any growth due to 
uh, due to thermal expansion, then that's this spring's job, right? So this spring right here. Um, and it's a wave spring, so it'll fit right in there. Um, yeah, and the final part of the system itself is this. This is our, uh, our essentially lock nut. This is holding it in place, um, really capturing our rotor and stator positions all together. And then finally, this is our heat sink. Uh, this is kind of a new development um, in terms of manufacturing. Um, so essentially we took half inch plates, water jet cut out this pattern, our heat sink pattern, and then we're bolting it together using all thread. Um, and that is right here. So from these different things, it's clear we have built, we have not yet tested, um, and we are using this time before our test to tweak a couple different things, notably the fan. Um, so in summary, will it burn? We don't think so. Will it, will it fly apart? We also don't think so. And we're going to test to make sure those assumptions are true. I don't know what happened there. I don't know how to work this space machine. <laughs> Okay, there we go. Uh, this is a backup slide. Here we go. Motor control. Uh, okay. Where did the slides go? <laughs> Here. You stand up there. Can there's different slides, not more slides. You want to get to? Oh. Let's just walk through. Oh, they're all there. They're just in different orders. I don't know where you went. We lost them. There it is. Oh. Can you just go to the? Give us a second. Where do you want to go? Sorry. Sorry, Nate. Oh, Nate. Thank you, sir. Thank okay. you. Good luck. Okay, good to go. Yeah. All right, so. Sure. All right, so I'm Nate. Um, so my time here uh, has mainly been focused on manufacturing uh, armature windings for our motor. And so, like Reed, there's several question, questions that need to be answered when we're manufacturing uh, these windings. The first one is electrical losses. So we'll go through, you know, there's several different types of losses that need to be considered. Um, heat dissipation. Reed talked about um, there's going to be pretty high heat within the stator, so will the insulation that uh, is on the windings, will that withstand um, the heat that's going to be uh, occurring at that location in the motor? Um, talking about insulation, we also need to talk about the uh, dielectric ca capability. So there's several different types of insulation on these windings. We'll talk about that. And then mechanical uh, considerations, you know, will the windings actually hold up in the motor? Um, are they structurally sound? Um, as well as can they be actually manufactured? Which, yes, they can. We've been doing it. So, so the first thing that we need to talk about when we talk about these windings is what we use to make them. Um, we use lens wire, um, which is basically a bunch of bundles of smaller wire um, intertwined together. So if you look at the top figure here, um, there's 15 bundles. Each bundle is wrapped in Nomex insulation. And then the strands, and then there's 44 strands of copper within that bundle, um, each of which is 38 uh, American wire gauge. Um, those are also have um, insulation on them. That's a polyamide insulation. So you can also see on the bottom picture there that um, it's a rectangular shape. So the wires are interwoven, and then 
you can see that uh, at the insulation, you can see the Nomex insulation and then the, uh, the individual strands. So how do we make this thing? Um, so this is actually what we're making. This is a CAD model of the winding. Um, we've, we've made a design change to manufacture these windings in a series pair. So basically what that means is when we're making these things, um, we make two and there's a connection between these two windings. And we do this to eliminate, we basically uh, half the connections that we, solder connection that we would have to have um, within the motor. So let's get to the actual questions then. Um, the first one is electrical losses. So obviously uh, there's going to be AC and DC losses with, uh, within the windings, but we also want to consider uh, termination and connection losses. So you know we're, we're dealing with a lot of the AC and, and DC losses with the lens wire. Um, there's a high copper fill factor, and because of the topology of the uh, lens wire, um, we, the AC uh, losses are also minimized. But when we are trying to connect, when we're making these connections, um, there's a solder joints that we have to consider. Um, and so when we solder these, when we're doing these connections, all 666 strands are soldered together. So not only is that going to be a point of loss that we're thinking about, but it's also um, going to be a potential hotspot. So that's something that we need to uh, consider. So talk, uh, going into hotspots, I guess we will, next thing we'll talk about is uh, heat dissipation. So there's three different types of insulation, and they all need to be able to withstand 180 degrees. Um, in uh, in the stator. So basically, um, like I mentioned before, the strand insulation type is polyamide, and that is a class R uh, insulation. So it, it is rated up to 220 degrees Celsius. Um, the bundle insulation is Nomex. This is a recent design change. We the trials that we've been showing are actually nylon. And that was rated only up to 155 degrees Celsius. Nomex is now rated to uh, 200 degrees Celsius, which um, will be which which will allow us to uh, be, have our I, well, it's within our ratings I guess, or our specs. Um, one thing that we will have to change in the future is the turn insulation that we're using. Currently, we're using glass fiber. Um, that's only a class F insulation which is only rated to 155 degrees Celsius. That's something that we're going to be changing here very soon. So the next thing we need to consider talking about insulations, um, how, do, how does the insulation look within the winding? What is the insulation scheme? So um, the first thing we'll talk about is the turn uh, insulation. So if you look at the figure here on the right, um, the middle turn is fully wrapped in glass fiber. So, and you can also see that kind of in this picture here. The middle turn is uh, wrapped in glass fiber. Then we also have the, uh, the bundle insulation, which is Nomex, and uh, the strand insulation, which is polyamide. Um, the so the insulation, um, all, each insulation has a different dielectric strength. Um, Nomex, uh, Nomex and glass fiber have similar um, dielectric strengths, and polyamide has a very high uh, dielectric strength. We're also using a uh, resin, the Dur Durlico uh, 128 resin, which has ceramic properties, which also helps uh, with the dielectric uh, capabilities of this winding. So next, um, we'll talk about the mechanical considerations. So um, there's a lot of tolerant, dimensional tolerances that need to be met within uh, the motor. So obviously, we need to fit 30 of these windings um, in the stator. And how do, how do we do that? Um, so one of the major dimensions that we worry about is the height of the uh, the radial height within the winding. 
So that would be this height right here. Um, so if that gets too large, the air gap will not be um, large enough and we'll start to get some friction. Or it would be, yeah, the results would not be good if we start uh, having some rubbing between our magnets and windings. So you can see here, um, these are the dimensions that we're mainly looking at. Um, we also look at the end winding axial thickness, which would be this thick, well, actually that thickness right there. Um, the, there could be some uh, airflow considerations with Reed's fan um, that we're thinking about. If that gets too large, um, that could be a problem. Um, so going back to the resin then, um, and we use two types of resin. Basically, the, the whole winding active end, end regions are covered in the 128 uh, Duralico resin, um, which is, becomes stiff after curing. Um, we also use RTV on the leads and the connection piece, um, so that, uh, we, well, the reason we use that is because the uh, after curing RTV prevents debrading of the lens wire, but it's not stiff. You can still bend it after curing. So. Next, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the manufacturing process. So the whole process takes about 12 hours to complete um, up to curing stage. And then stripping and soldering stage takes another two hours uh, after that. So we begin with uh, laying out the wire and coating it with a layer of the 128 resin and then the RTV um, in the regions that I had just discussed. We wait three hours, let it cure a little bit, so it's tough enough to uh, prevent debrading, but not hard enough to not bend. And then we move on to the winding stage. So we hand wind three turns on each, um, on each coil. And on the middle turn, like I said, we apply the, uh, we apply the glass fiber. And in between the turns, we also apply additional uh, 128 resin. The next stage is curing. So we, once we have the, the windings completely uh, are completed, we clamp the windings to apply pressure on all of the regions equally. And then we take it to an oven to be cured at 120 uh, degrees C for two hours. Then we let it sit overnight. And we take the, uh, the winding out of the fixture, and it's ready to be stripped and soldered. So the stripping stage, uh, mainly, there's two steps. Um, basically, we physically take off the bundle insulation, and then we chemically take off the strand insulation, and then we solder it using a uh, solder pot. So going forward, we need to be, start testing uh, these windings to validate that the, the windings that we're making are actually going to be able to be used within our motor. And the two tests that we're going to be uh, doing is the mega test and the surge test. The mega test basically uh, just tests external um, bundle insulation. I'll talk about that in a little minute. In a minute. Um, but the next test that we're starting to uh, starting to begin to um, I guess implement is the surge test and the surge test um, a so a circuit diagram of the surge test is shown over here. And basically, the idea is that we'll apply a large voltage uh, impulse with increasing voltage, and we'll look at the resonant frequencies produced by that impulse. If we see that um, the frequency is increasing, we know that the inductance um, has decreased, which means that we have a turn. We, we potentially have a turn-to-turn -turn fault. And the next, so this is the mega test. Um, one key thing to note is that when we're, we were actually um, conducting this test, we had a large weight on top of this winding to make sure that um, all the surfaces were, uh, all the surface area of the uh, third turn was uh, touching the metal plate there. So basically the idea is, is we connect the, connect the positive leads to, or positive 
terminal to the leads of the winding, and then the negative uh, to the the metal plate. And the measure then uh, measures the resistance that's touching this metal plate. Um, so as you can see, uh, we see we're getting pretty large, uh, pretty large resistances on the regions that we were testing. Uh, an interesting thing to note, I guess, is that the more resin that you apply, um, the hot, it, it greatly increases uh, the resistance that we see uh, during this test. And that should be it. So I guess we'll go back to the other slides and Shalong will. Hi everyone, I'm Xiaolong and uh, I will talk about the motor control part of this project. And uh, the target of performing motor control is to implement field-oriented control methods to drive this motor, make it spin. And uh, we would also like to improve the system static and the dynamic performance uh, using advanced control uh, algorithms. Um, we're going to build a uh, flying capacitor multi-level inverter to drive this motor. And uh, the sinusoidal PWM algorithm is used to generate the switching signals. And uh, we have performed um, simulation uh, for the control system using MATLAB Simulink. And uh, this picture shows the uh, overall control structure of this system. So it, it has two loops, uh, an outer loop and a, um, sorry, an, an inner current loop and an outer speed loop. So we are going to control the uh, direct and quadrature axis current. And uh, this picture shows um, how to generate the desired voltage from this control system. Um, the first picture is a seven level phase to neutral voltage. We use a uh, flying capacitor inverter and uh, sinusoidal PWM to generate this voltage waveform. And uh, uh, from we, we generate this seven level phase to neutral voltage and we can get that a 13 level line to nine voltage. So we can see that um, uh, if you look at the uh, fundamental component of it, it will be a sinusoidal waveform. And uh, thus we can see what, uh, once we apply this voltage waveform to this motor, uh, we can get a current and torque uh, out from the motor. And uh, this picture shows what kind of uh, torque and uh, current we can um, excite in the motor. Um, the first picture is the electromagnetic torque. Uh, we can see that it, it generates a desired torque and the peak-to-peak -peak ripple is quite small because we are using this uh, multi-level structure to increase the equivalent switching frequency and uh, the, also the, uh, 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 the step voltage is uh, uh, smaller. And uh, the current amplitude uh, is, also, is 137 and uh, the peak-to-peak -peak ripple is also small and uh, the, the switching frequency is quite high, it's 720. So one concern is that uh, from this high frequency uh, current component, uh, AC losses will be induced. So we, we want to examine how large it is. And so we use finite element uh, simulation to quantify the, these effects. And, uh, First, from the drive simulation, we, we first calculate the uh, different current components, and then we inject, 
uh, inject these components into the finite element simulation, we can see that the um, DC loss is about uh, 2.6 kilowatt, and uh, the AC loss component is about 2 kilowatt, and uh, the AC loss due to the high frequency uh, current harmonics is quite small, it's just 80 watt. Um, so it's small because we choose a relatively small strength, we, we use uh, leads wire to, uh, to reduce these effects. And uh, we performed scaling studies to see uh, um, the AC losses, uh, how AC losses will change with the uh, inverter levels. We can see that because we choose this uh, uh, small wire gauge, uh, the AC losses are, are uh, con contained in uh, acceptable level. And uh, this shows the dynamic responses of the system. Um, when, when we change the load torque and uh, ch or change the speed command to see whether the motor speed will track the command or track the load. And uh, we can see that uh, during these transient processes, the system is stable and uh, it is able to to track the speed command and the load changes. Um, next question is how to implement this because we have a large motor and we we need to build a uh, inverter of the same power rating and uh, this inverter will be uh, separated into five modules. So our motor is also um, separated into five modules and uh, each module will be driven by one inverter and as the control structure will uh, be adaptable, uh, will adapt to this uh, overall system structure. So we're gonna have a central controller to, to model the machine and to estimate the system state and then we're gonna have a FPGA layer, uh, FPGA controllers as a second layer of controllers to perform the <coughs> to uh, send out the switching commands to each of the inverter and their uh, switches. So this is more like a paralleling structure and uh, uh, in each uh, control channel, uh, we are gonna have a hierarchical pattern. We're gonna have a outer speed control loop and inner current control loop and, uh, and also the uh, inverter internal control loop. Yeah, so um, yeah, that, that we're gonna have uh, Chris to, 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 talk, to talk about the power electronics converter structure. Um, um, so our next step is to implement this uh, in hardware. Uh, we, we're gonna have uh, uh, build some experimental setup to perform this paralleling control and uh, using the flying capacitor uh, inverter to drive the motor. So this is our uh, project status schedule. And uh, we, we are doing this uh, uh, critical design review and uh, we're gonna test the rotor and test the stator. And uh, eventually we are gonna build the whole motor uh, in, 70, in 2017 and test it. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. No. Um, uh, no, because to perform the motor control, you kind of need to know what is the machine state. For example, you have uh, some state variables like current and the rotor angle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the field oriented control will be um, be implemented in the microcontroller by uh, sensing those signals and uh, perform some uh, machine modeling calculations and then get desired 
uh, current and voltage. Um, like what, what is the desired current and voltage waveform? You will send that to the FPGA and then the FPGA will determine uh, uh, what kind of uh, switching sequences need to be performed to each uh, switches, to all the switches. Because, because this inverter has a lot of uh, switches. It's like uh, one inverter is only 20 kilowatt rating and uh, you have two interleaved, two inverters interleaved, and then uh, five to six, these inverter modules parallel. So there are a lot of switches. So you need to synchronize them using FPGA. Where are you gonna fit all these control circuits in the motor? So that's one of those things that we are still looking at. So we don't know yet. We have some thoughts, but we're not sure yet. Maybe it's, it will not be in the motor. It will be. It will in, not be integrated. It will yeah. all be one package. Because the FPGs are usually sensitive to biomagnetic areas. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's, that's good to know. One million feet of all that. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.